three days ago to give a seminar. So two days ago, okay, great. So if it's a bit off topic, you know, who you can blame, so. Uh, yes, uh, so I changed a little bit the title compared to what you see in the, in the sheet, but uh, yeah, because it's, uh, there will be just a little bit about the, the um, about barogenesis, and it's mostly about the electroweak phase transition. Uh, so this is based on work done with uh, uh, Riccardo Rattazzi and uh, Alfredo Liotti, a student at EPFL. The plan is the following. So I, I will give you just a brief introduction. I, I, we're changing subject here. This is particle physics, uh, colliders, and stuff like that. So uh, I will give you, since we have people in the audience who are, might not be so familiar with these, uh, these questions, I will talk a little bit about the Higgs potential, some of the questions that are related to that, for example, uh, the electroweak phase transition, why do we care about that? And then I will mention, I will tell you that there are essentially three types of electroweak phase transitions, three possibilities. I see only three. If you have, if you see more, please let me know. Uh, and I will talk uh, about the third one, which is a little bit exotic and it has been developed uh, essentially last year, um, which is an option where there is basically no phase transition, or maybe it's very early. It appears very, very early earlier than the, the scales of order, temperatures of the order of the, of the electroweak scale. And I will give you some, some model that does that and some application. So why am I asking this? Okay, very briefly, uh, this is what we know about the Higgs boson. Very, very simply, well, the Higgs boson, let me call it H here, it's a doublet. Uh, in a first approximation, this is perfectly consistent with data. What we know is that essentially it's couplings to, uh, to the gauge fields coming from the covariant derivative and it's couplings to, to at least uh, the, the heaviest of the, of the fermions are essentially as predicted by the standard model up to corrections of order five to 10%. Then we know of course something about the potential but what we know about the potential is just a little bit. Uh, in particular we know the vacuum expectation value. We know that very, very well of course. We knew that uh, uh, even before the LHC with great precision. Uh, we we know, now know the mass with great precision also, but we know very little about the self-coupling. So we do not know really what is the shape of the effective, of the, of the potential of the Higgs. So uh, even at the, at the end of the, of the, of the high luminosity run of the LHC, we will, we will know just a little bit. Uh, I mean, couplings, deviations uh, in deviations of order, a factor of 10 even, might be consistent with the future uh, data from the LHC. So what does this imply? Well, this implies that we know very little about the Higgs potential and also about the electroweak phase transition. So uh, this is the, 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 the potential predicted by the standard model without higher dimensional operators. So removing the cutoff from, from, uh, from the weak scale. I mean, take it very far above the, the weak scale. Um, but of course, if we, if we have some additional physics, I will give you some examples of all these options here. If we add some new physics, it might be, the potential might look like, like that. Uh, or might even look like a uh, multi-dimensional, I didn't draw anything here, but uh, it might be a multi-dimensional uh, uh, potential in, in field space. So, well, okay, uh, not knowing anything about the finite temperature, sorry, about the zero temperature potential, and uh, we do not know even what happens at finite temperature, of course. So why do we care about that? So we do not know about the electric phase transition in particular. So why do we care about that? Well, we are curious, of course, I mean, we should ask questions. This is the zero folder question. The, the zero further answer. And, and then, of course, uh, the fact that we do not know about the electroweak phase transition means that we do not know what happens to temperatures above 100 GV or so, okay? Uh, this is something it's very hard to probe uh, uh, in, in ways different from colliders, but uh, maybe gravitational waves. In fact, yeah, it, so, okay, suppose we have a, a deformation of the Higgs potential such that we have a very strong first order phase transition, we might see some uh, some gravitational wave uh, uh, coming from uh, with, uh, with the frequencies associated to that. Um, this is another motivation maybe to, to ask these questions. But then perhaps, at least to me, the main motivation is, to, uh, um, is related to biogenesis because the, as I will mention, there is a possibility if the, the transition is first order, we have a possibility of realizing what's called electroweak biogenesis, uh, which is a mechanism to generate the barrier symmetry at, uh, precisely when the phase transition occurs, okay? So this is just to tell you where we are now and what are the main questions that we would like to, to address. Uh, so what are the three options that I see? Well, uh, the first option is that the, the, the electric phase transition is continuous. This is precisely what happens in the standard model. 
Uh, another option is that it is discontinuous. And in order to do that, you have to add something to the standard model. And I will give you some examples of what you could do. A third option is that there is no transition, that the electric symmetry stays unbroken even at finite temperature. Okay? This is another option. I don't see any other options. So we'll talk about very briefly about the first one, because this is what the standard model does, and we are all familiar with that. And then I will mention some example about the discontinuous uh, possibility. Uh, this has been studied uh, quite a bit. And then I will mostly focus on the third one, which is uh, uh, the new one. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the standard model, what, what does it do? The standard model, if you hit the standard model, what happens essentially is that uh, there are thermal corrections to the Higgs mass that are positive, coming from uh, the, the degrees of freedom of capital to the Higgs, and in particular the Higgs boson itself, uh, gauge that make the, the Higgs mass, the thermal Higgs mass positive at large temperature, which means that the, the zero order, sorry, the, the, the zero temperature potential is uh, now becoming with that form. So the, the, the vacuum expectation value now is that the origin, the electric symmetry is restored. For the discontinuous case, this is, as I said, we have to add something because the standard model doesn't do that. So uh, what I will do is to uh, use everybody's model, just as a toy model, of course, just to illustrate what are the ingredients that we have to introduce and what are the properties of the new physics uh, that are required in order to have a discontinuous electroweak phase transition. So I'm adding a sc uh, scalar singlet, S, with couplings of order G star, what I call G star, and a mass of order M star. And then, OK, its couplings, are, so being a singlet, its couplings to the Higgs boson can be of this form. So now we have, uh, OK, the many, many different uh, uh, regimes that we can, we can have a look at. And the first one that I, that I uh, would like to point out is the heavy S regime. And this has been studied by Grosjean, uh, Jolie Servant, uh, and James Wells in 2005. Uh, th the idea is that uh, if S is heavy, actually heavy here means that this parameter, which is defined here, is sufficiently small. If it is sufficiently small, which means that S is sufficiently heavy, we can neglect higher dimensional operators. We can truncate higher dimensional operators. So that's why I, I, I can neglect these uh, dimension eight, seven, if they're uh, operators. Uh, well, not seven, but uh, dimension eight. Um, uh, so this is the, the expansion parameter in my effective field theory. Um, and this is, these are the coefficients, at least for the, the leading ones, I mean, the leading operators up to dimension six that we get, at least at three level. Of course, at one loop level, we get many, or many more operators. But of course, if the couplings are weak, <laughs> this is a good approximation. So the, 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 first important, the, the most important one is, is this one, uh, because this is an operator that essentially corrects the kinetic term of the Higgs. And because of that, once the Higgs gets a VEV, it shifts its wave function. And therefore, all the Higgs, all the Higgs couplings couplings to the W, the Z, and the top quark. And because we know that this is, uh, these are essentially standard model-like, it means that this coefficient has to be small. Okay? So this is a constraint that we impose. Of course, if epsilon is small, this is already guaranteed. Okay? Uh, we also have a dimension 6 operator, which corrects the potential. And here I'm normalizing this in such a way that uh, uh, this coefficient, C, if C6 is of order 1, it means that uh, this operator corrects at order one the Higgs potential because the Higgs potential presumably has a VEV. Well, uh, the, this V here is the VEV of the, of the Higgs boson by assumption. So uh, when the Higgs gets uh, its vacuum expectation value of order V, these two terms are comparable, okay, by definition when C6 is of order one. Uh, but the point is that when C6 of order one, what does it mean? So we have an order one correction to the, to the Higgs potential when, when C6 of order one, which means that this coefficient has to be large because this coefficient, if you see what uh, C6 is, has to be one over epsilon, but epsilon has to be small. So uh, this coefficient has to be pretty large, which means that we are essentially fine tuning the quartic. So we are taking, uh, we are choosing parameters in such a way that the quartic is smaller. Uh, okay, we, this is the price we have to pay. We can do that, and we can choose, for example, the parameters in such a way that the Higgs mass, this mass here, is positive. Uh, the Higgs quartic, this one, is negative. So at zero temperature, we have something like this. Okay? When we heat the system, again, you can show that the potential goes like that. So this inevitably leads to a first order phase transition. Uh, you will have to go from this vacuum to the true vacuum when the temperature decreases. Okay, so here the fine tuning of a quartic and of course a usual, the mass, this is necessary, but you can have, uh, this is perfectly consistent with all we know about the Higgs potential and about uh, the standard model. Sorry, uh, why do you yeah. shift the, why do you split the shift to lambda h? Again? No, sorry, because lambda was this parameter here. Yeah. 
that I started with, and uh, the exchange at three level, the three level exchange of S gives you also a uh, quartic. Um, you split it between from C here. times G star, right? And then C appears also on the the H squared squared classes for CH. Mm -hmm. What's the question exactly? Uh, why you split uh, lambda H? No, no, I'm telling you that this is, the I mean, in terms of the, of, the, of the parameters that we that we have seen in the previous slide, this one, these are the parameters that define this Lagrangian. So lambda H is that, and CH is this one. So uh, this coefficient has to be larger, much larger than that, in order to have a deformation, not one deformation, which means tuning. So there's another regime, take the same model, but consider another regime. Now I'm considering a Z2 <coughs> symmetry for simplicity, otherwise there are too many, too many uh, parameters. So there is another regime where this, the parameter epsilon that I called before, uh, that I defined before, is larger than one. Now the effective field theory is no more valid, and so S is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a dynamical variable that I have to consider. Now the potential is effectively two-dimensional, and people have shown, well, this is very easy to see, that if the mass the three level mass here is negative and this coefficient is positive. So the, the quartic, uh, the coupling between, between the Higgs and S is positive, you have a barrier. And what happens is that you start again from the origin at high temperature, again, the usual story. The first thing that you have is a, a second order phase transition into uh, um, a configuration where S only gets a VEV, but H does not. And then you're forced to have, again, a first order phase transition in order to get to, to the electric back in the standard model. So again, this is an example where you have what's called the two-step transition that's uh, by necessity, again, first order, okay? Here, the constraints are very, very mild. Actually, the main constraint is that this Higgs can, shouldn't decay into S otherwise, uh, but this is a very mild constraint. So this is, again, possible. So we have seen that, uh, again, an example of continuous transition and an example of discontinuous transition. Uh, here we need to add something. Uh, something. Uh, of course, it's always possible to have a continuous transition if also if we have additional physics coupled to the Higgs. This is obvious, right? But the minimal possibilities to have just the standard model. So what about the no transition hypothesis? Again, let me take, uh, again, the same model. Now I'm writing it a little bit more, uh, a little bit different in, in order to, to conform with the notation that we use in our paper. Uh, and I will assume now, which is crucial, as you will see, that uh, this S carries an, uh, uh, a representation under some ON symmetry, okay? <coughs> so I have N copies of, uh, of, uh, of this field. And um, as you will see, this is necessary and actually very, very welcome, you know, if you want to trust your finite temperature calculation. Um, uh, so the fact that it is possible to have symmetry no restoration was first pointed out, as usual, by Weinberg in 70, when, 74. Uh, and then uh, last year, uh, three papers uh, came out discussing this in, in the particular case of the electric phase transition. So I will talk about my paper. So the, the key observation of, of Weinberg was that this quartic can be negative. And because of that, of course, it cannot be too negative, otherwise it destabilizes the potential. Uh, be, but because of that, you can have uh, a correction to the, to the Higgs mass, to the thermal Higgs mass, that is negative, okay? But the point is that this has to, uh, to, to balance and actually to win over the standard model contribution, which is, again, positive and pretty large, actually. So if you have n scalars, you have an n there. So you need, okay, you have a large positive contribution here, and you need a large negative contribution, so you need a large n, okay? Uh, you will see that this is perfectly consistent. So uh, in a first approximation, this is all you need. Essentially, you just need a negative mass and that's it, okay? And um, what did I do here? This is, uh, this is wrong, so you shouldn't look at that. <laughs> so at final temperature here, there should be, if this mass is negative, of course, we are again in this, uh, in this, uh, this behavior here, even at final temperature, okay? Um, so you immediately see, and here I quantify how large n can be and how large and should be, right? So it has to win over the positive contribution of the standard model. This is essentially the constraint dominated by, by condi a condition at the weak scale. Then we can impose stability, and uh, if these two requirements together imply that in this toy model, just the Higgs gets a VEV, which is exactly what we wanted. S doesn't get any VEV. Um, but you see, combining these two, you get that N has to be larger than something. And you see that N has to be larger than essentially the inverse of your expansion parameter, apparently, uh, in, in, your, in your calculation. So if your expansion parameter is uh, uh, 10 to minus two, it means that n has to be, well, you guess. Uh, so you need a large n, right? This is the price you have to pay if you want to do this thing. Uh, but we found a curious, 
Fourier scaling uh, with, a, with the large n limit of this theory. And you find that by, by looking, for example, at what is the condition to preserve perturbativity in this model. So, of course, the, the quartic, the Higgs quartic has to be small in units of 16 pi squared. This is the usual uh, NDA estimate. Again, if you're familiar with large n expansion, uh, the self-couplings of a large n theory has to have a small top coupling if you want to have perturbation theory. But the funny thing is what happens to the, to the coupling between this large n dynamics and the Higgs. Now the condition is different. Is there's a square root here. You can see this in many different ways. You can look at correlators uh, or, or amplitudes with uh, normalized states, uh, uh, properly normalized states, or multi-loop calculations. I mean, you can do it in several different ways. You, you find that this is the expansion parameter, okay? But this is crucial, actually, because you find a very funny regime. Because if you look, if you go back to look at the, at the thermal mass, um, thermal mass contribution um, coming from S to the, to the Higgs, you get that this is the, the typical contribution that we scaled, I mean, we written in terms of uh, the expansion parameters, is something like that. Which means that you have a funny regime. This is just a, a weird regime, but at least, I mean, this is what will allow us to make the calculations, actually. There is a safe regime in which something very funny happens. This, uh, this funny thing that happens is that you can have sizable, actually very large, finite temperature effects because the thermal mass can be large. Actually, can be, I mean, in principle, can be as large as you want if n can be large as you want. Uh, um, and at the same time, have a perturbative theory. So epsilon at zero temperature. Epsilon can be very small, as small as you want, but still you have sizable finite temperature effects. This is a little bit counterintuitive, right? You have a dynamics that is completely weakly coupled. You heat it and you get a large effect in the, in the effective potential. So the reason why this happens, and actually this is completely general, uh, I mean, this applies to uh, a whole class of dynamics coupled like that. So if you have all some operator of large end dynamics coupled to, to the Higgs, uh, this is often called the Higgs pattern, the same thing happens. So if you, can run, if you carefully normalize the, 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 the couplings here, this action is the expansion parameter. There's, there should be a square root of n over there, which is exactly the same that we had. If you, if you go back, it's exactly the same thing we see in the toy model. Again, if epsilon is very small, the theory at zero temperature is perturbative. You have everything under control. But as soon as you thermalize, and the point here is that you have to thermalize n states, a lot of states that have weak couplings. So you have to do something funny in a way, right? You have to wait longer, long enough in order to thermalize n states. But as soon as you have done that, you have many, many of these states around, and therefore you have large coherent effects. So this is a weird thing. Uh, and these large coherent effects can induce a large Higgs mass, thermal Higgs mass. Uh, and, yeah. Two-loop Yes. Large yeah, 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 the expansion, the expansion, yeah. Uh, I will go back to, I mean, we've done a large N calculation where, if this is what you're asking. Uh, the, large N, the large N expansion is perfectly sensible. I will tell you what happens. Uh, as an expansion in epsilon in just a few slides, okay? Um, but the, so the, I want to possess that here something funny can happen, right? That can, can have implications even, uh, okay, maybe be quite mild, but still can have some implications, right? If the Higgs has a large VEV at finite temperature, it means that there are some degrees of freedom that can, in principle, decouple. The top, the Higgs, so on, can decouple from the bath. So this is a funny regime, but this is precisely what allows us to make a calculation. Now, to answer Brando's question, what, when you start making calculations at finite temperature, you have to be a little bit careful uh, because the expansion parameters have to be identified. So what I said before was true in a first, first leading order approximation, but I didn't say what is the leading order approximation, I mean, what is the small parameter, okay? So when you do a finite temperature calculation, at least a static one, you essentially have to consider uh, an effective field theory in three dimensions. You essentially, you compactify in time, and therefore you generate some sort of calusa klein mass state. This is actually very similar to what we have seen yesterday by Leonardo Senatore in, in DS. Uh, it's, uh, of course, completely analogous if you look at static quantities. You have a calusa klein mass controlled by the temperature for pi t. And then you have light states. These light states have a mass that is a loop factor smaller than the, than the calusa klein, which is nothing but the Debye mass. And because this is a three-dimensional theory, uh, something important happens. Uh, the couplings can be relevant. So, uh, quartic coupling becomes a relevant coupling, okay? And the fact that it is relevant, it means that you can have strong effects because you can have strong infrared effects, precisely as we have seen in, in, in the theater yesterday. Uh, this also implies that there is a poor convergence of the perturbative expansion, okay? The reason is that 
the typical, okay, let's look at the, this is the, the easy part, the expansion parameter typically for the heavy modes. If you start making a gazillion loop with, uh, uh, with the heavy modes, the typical expansion parameter will be something like that. It's the, 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 the I mean, g squared n times t, just by dimensional analysis, again, uh, divided by, okay, there's a four pi here because in two dimensions this is typically what happens instead of 16 pi squared. But anyway, this is, this is of course, uh, uh, this has to be measured in units of the typical mass scale of the problem. In the case of loops of the heavy fields, this is the heavy fields, and what you get is that, of course, the Caruso kind of loops are just four-dimensional loops, okay? So uh, you get something that is not surprising. The problem is with, with the light modes, and in this case, if you go through the same calculation, you see that the expansion parameter is actually the square root of the expansion parameter in, in four dimensions, which is, again, exactly as, as Senatore was showing yesterday. So uh, the perturbative series is less convergent. In fact, I mean, if you see, I mean, you see, you start from a theory that uh, at zero temperature has an expansion parameter over the 10 to minus two, you go at finite temperature, the expansion parameter is now 10%. And you typically have all the one numbers running around, right, when you, when you do loops. And this 10% accuracy is not good at all. Uh, in fact, you do very large error, all the one errors in general. So what we had to do, well, actually, what we decided to do was to take advantage of the fact that we, there is this limit in which n is large to use a large n expansion. And the large n expansion is completely safe because it's an expansion in a dimensionless, uh, dimensionless parameter. So the same, the same rules that apply to t equals zero apply to the finite temperature. So the, the topology of diagrams do not change. So we use the large n expansion in order to resum all these large corrections of what the square root of epsilon. We use an auxiliary field uh, method, I and mean, this is uh, uh, usually at finite temperature, people start using uh, more or less ad hoc resummation techniques. This is a completely safe, uh, uh, yes? So when I think about thermal state as a particular mass of particle state, so I suggest that there are large corrections there, it should be a large correction no, but of some other mass of particle state. Okay, here I'm talking, here, here I'm talking about, uh, f uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about uh, static quantities like, you know, free energy and stuff like that. I don't, I'm, see, not no, even. The question, you're saying in the zero temperature there are no oh. large effects, at th the thermal state there are large effects. Oh, suggest that there should be also large effects. There, there could be, there could be, yeah, there could be. Is it the of particles that are not this, this, uh, this, I don't know, I mean, I don't know actually uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, yeah, what is it that you can have? I'm not familiar with anything you can have actually, but in principle, what? No, I thought you. The question, what's the, question? Uh, the, the question is that uh, maybe you can have some, essentially some coherent, large coherent enhancement even at zero temperature. I, I to be honest, I don't. To, I see it's possible, but I don't. I don't have any familiar example. Uh, but yeah, I don't see any reason why there, there couldn't be. But if you look at yeah, scattering of um, I mean ordinary particles, uh, one particle states, uh, it should be uh, epsilon is my as usual my. No, wait a second, of course, uh, yeah. Okay, I think that Ricardo will talk about something. Yeah, the reference is strong, the 2 to n scattering. Yeah. Exactly, so yeah, yeah, but, yeah but, the n, but that n is not this n, right? So it's not. Uh, yeah, but maybe here when that n becomes a for the this n. So yes, yes, like yeah, first we have to understand what happens to 2 to n prime scattering, right? I mean, well, this I don't. Not. maybe here it becomes strong. Yes, yes, yeah, but first we have to understand what happens in. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think, I mean, vaguely related to that. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry, I will not tell you what Ricardo is talking about, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just to give you that we have done the, the large end calculation, that's just that, okay? Uh, and the large end calculation actually confirms what we, what we have seen before with the very crude approximation. There are, of course, always subtleties, but uh, at the end of the day, this is essentially the, the, the value of the Higgs as a, as a function of the temperature. Indeed, if the couplings are sufficiently large and n is sufficiently large, we can have uh, a no symmetry restoration. Here, this is a case in which there is a, a regime between, say, I mean, 100 GV and 10 to 4 GV, where there is a, um, a restoration of the, of the electric symmetry. Otherwise, I mean, these are a multitude of possibilities that, that, can, that can be realized, okay? So if you look at the, this constraint on n, it's actually the one that I mentioned before was a little bit naive. Uh, the truth is that there are very important effects that come into play. For example, that this quantity has to be large in order to win over the top quark uh, contribution, but the top quark contribution is 
more significant at the weak scale. So this bound has to be taken actually at the weak scale. On the other hand, you see there is one over lambda h here, and lambda h actually goes to zero very, very fast if the R cutoff is, is, is large, again, due to the top, uh, to the top Yukawa. So if your cutoff is large, if this lambda is large, well, it means that n has to be larger, okay? If your cutoff is, I mean, a few TV, uh, n can be, of course, uh, much, much smaller. And in fact, yeah, let me comment on that. So how large n needs to be? Well, this depends, as I, as I told you already, this depends on how large your cutoff is. So the, the plot that we have seen before, and these numbers are actually, sorry, this number 50 here is in the case in which the cutoff is very large. The largest we could get, uh, something like 100 GV, uh, sorry, 100 TV or 1,000 TV. Uh, but of course, if it's a few TV, the situation is, uh, is much better. And also another thing that, we, that, that is crucial in this constraint that I mentioned before is stability. This thing that appears here, this, this uh, inequality is just stability, okay? uh, absolute stability. But you don't need absolute stability. You can have uh, a metastability. In that case, and decreases. Just even having a cutoff at 100 TV, uh, and can be 20, 30. When you get close to 20, 30, I don't think this is as crazy as, uh, as before. I mean, as it, as it might be, actually. Take just an adjoint of SU5. I mean, it's just, uh, just uh, for people who feel have a feeling of beauty, uh, and over the 20, 30 is crazy, but maybe a joint of SU5 looks better. It's the square root of n. So OK, so how many minutes do I have? Right here? OK, so uh, now we have seen, actually, we, we have, in a way, proved that there is at least a regime, a limit, in which uh, uh, the electric symmetry, the idea of electric symmetry non-restoration works. So this is uh, actually uh, the third option works. It, it is possible. But the question is, what is it good for? I mean, why do I, why do I care about that? And the reason we cared, actually, was electric biogenesis. So electric biogenesis is a, is a very nice idea. Uh, well, it was, I think, vaguely mentioned by Dimopoulos and Saskin uh, many years ago, uh, and then, uh, I mean, proposed uh, more precisely by Kuzmin and, 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 and Shaposhnikov and collaborators. So the idea is the following. It's essentially just to use phalerons as the source of B violation, okay? And this is, if you want, the definition of, uh, of electroweak biogenesis. The standard model itself has a uh, binary number violation from the electroweak uh, sector. Um, of course, as Zakharov has explained, we need also departure from equilibrium, but this happens if we have a first order phase transition. And, and we have seen that we can have a first order phase transition by in several ways. We can modify the standard model to, to achieve that. Again, C, C violation, we have it in the standard model. The problem with, uh, with this program is, of course, CP violation, as usual, CP violation. Uh, because in order to realize this idea, we need uh, new physics with CP violating couplings to the standard model, either the Higgs or the, or the standard model fermions. Uh, but this physics has to be controlled, essentially. The, the mass scale of this physics is around the, uh, the temperature at which the phase transition occurs. So you immediately see that we have problems if we identify the electric phase transition scale with 100 GV, the standard one. And this is why these models, I mean, this whole business of uh, electric, electric biogenesis is, is in incredible tension, very strong tension with data. Uh, well, we have collider constraints, of course, we have flavor constraints if you have some flavor violation, but even, even then, I mean, if you, even if you take the most minimal models you can imagine, you have contributions at two loop level. Uh, so take a model where these CP violating couplings are involving the, the Higgs boson. You have loops like this one that contribute to the, um, to the electron lactic dipole moment, and these constraints are so strong that already tell you that that the current constraint already tell you that this, this combination has to be above a few TV, okay? So you see, if the electric weak phase transition occurs at the scale where it's supposed to happen in the standard model, uh, this cannot work. And the constraints are already too strong. So since we are geniuses, we thought, okay, we can apply this idea uh, of symmetry non restoration to structurally relax these constraints. You just have to, uh, again, add my, my scalar here, a light scalar that prevents the electric symmetry from, uh, from being restored when you hit the standard model, all the way to up to some cutoff, which could be, again, could be 1 TV, could be 100 TV, could be whatever scale, where you have actually electric phase transition. This way, you have a UV cutoff where you have some dynamics that modifies the Higgs potential in order to have an electric phase transition of first order. You have new sources of CP violation. You can realize this nice idea of electric biogenesis. But because this new physics is heavy, at zero temperature, this physics is completely decoupled from, uh, from, uh, from phenomenology. So in particular, their contribution to the electric dipole moment is negligible. Uh, of course, what you need to realize this is what we have seen before, right? You need 
uh, essentially you need a, a light uh, scalar S that couples to, to the Higgs in the way that we have seen. Now, in order to, to, to avoid the washout of, of the Banner symmetry generated here, of course, the spharons have to be dead. In order to be dead, again, the Higgs BEV has to be sufficiently large, okay? And we have seen that this is possible if n is sufficiently large. Again, at least 20, 30. This is the price to pay in order to have uh, this beautiful idea realized. Uh, so, yeah, just very quickly, again, this is just saying that at large n, at final temperature, at least uh, ordinary scattering processes uh, of uh, single particle states, this is, uh, uh, everything is suppressed by 1 over n, okay? So at future, okay, th this is a model that cannot be tested at the LHC, but it could be tested, I'm done, so it could be tested at, at future colliders. Oh yeah, there are also finally astrophysical constraints due to the fact that we have many of these guys, so, uh, 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 but in a way, this is uh, an effect similar to what uh, Sergei was mentioning. Uh, the, you see, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the abundance of, uh, if S is really stable, uh, as it is in this minimal model, then we have many of these particles. And it turns out that uh, the, 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 the abundance of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this field is n times larger than the abundance of a single S. And this is already ruled out very, very happily by, by direct detection experiments. But there are many ways to avoid this, of course. I mean, we have just to destabilize this field, this particle at cosmological scales, and this can be done in many different ways. We have half of the paper about peculiar large and meso phenomenology that you can realize in these models, but this is a whole different story. Uh, just to mention that the phase transition at 100 TV can be done, or at 10 TV, wherever, at the UV cutoff can be done in many different ways. We propose uh, these two new ways, but I mean, Again, the important point is that there is no obstruction. So the, the key thing is that you have this new degree of freedom, this many degree of freedom, sufficiently light. Actually, yeah, I should have mentioned that. It should be sufi sufficiently li light in order to, to compensate over the top contribution, the positive contribution of the top in the Higgs mass, of course. But it cannot be, so, so it cannot be about the TV because of that. And it cannot be too light, otherwise uh, uh, visible Higgs, Higgs decays are too strong. So let me conclude. I mean, this is uh, all I wanted to say, actually. Uh, I think that the conclusion is the following. So we have, we have seen that we have essentially three options for the electric phase transition. It's either continuous, discontinuous, or there is no transition at all, actually. The price to pay if you want to have, well, okay. Option one is the standard model. Price to pay zero, and this is, I will bet, what happens, right? But option two, if you really are into BSM physics, what you have to do to have a discontinuous phase transition is to add either new light fields or new light particles or heavy particles. In the case of light uh, particles, there are collider constraints and in the future we will be able to tell, okay? Maybe the 100 TV collider, if it's done, uh, maybe we'll be, we will be able to tell. If it's heavy new physics, well, this has to be a little bit fine-tuned as we have seen. Uh, option three, this weird option, uh, it's possible. We can realize that. There's a peculiar limit where my calculations are perfectly reliable and we can prove that this is the case. Actually, I mean, we, we have to, do this carefully because there were claims in the literature, people using lattice and stuff like that, that claiming that this is not possible, but I mean, we have an analytical method to show that this is possible, so uh, um, uh, analytical and reliable. The price to pay here is to have many light scalars, okay? And we have collider and astrophysical constraints. Uh, again, yes, model with the moderate N are possible, but the details have to be worked out. We, we, we emphasize a few ways to, to have that. And uh, let me emphasize also the following thing. So all this business, why do I care? Again, why do I care about the electric phase transition? One of the main reasons, and to me, this is the is whether or not electric biogenesis can be realized, okay? To me, this remains the main motivation to have option two or option three. And I think to most of, the, uh, to most of my colleagues. Uh, and so option two, which is the standard way to approach electric biogenesis, uh, so you have a first order phase transition at around the weak scale. This is I under incredible pressure, as we have seen. Collider, uh, EDM of the electron in particular, um, labor violation and so on. So to us, the best option is really to adopt option three and therefore move the electric phase transition up to higher scales. So, so the question is, is it worth to have N scales to do that? I'll let you answer that question. And I thank you.
completely okay or not? The fact that you have so many n scalar or not? Sorry, which bound? From the electric dipole moment bound. Yeah, but the, the, the point is that yeah, S. No, but uh, S is at the weak scale, but its scattings are completely CP invariant, right? That's the that's the that's the point. So we are adding new physics that is completely CP invariant, and all CP violations are at 100 TD or 10 TD, whatever they want to be. So that's the that's the whole point. So the, the the main the only problem with the electric biogenesis is the new sources of CP violation. With the symmetry no restoration, we can push them up to 10 TD, 100 TD. And we still keep, the, if you want, the predictivity of uh, electric biogenesis, which is we have to have new physics at a, t at a weak scale. This is S. It's a weird kind of new physics, but it is what it is. So, well, in principle, calculating the rate of baryon number violation at high energies is a tricky business. So, so these guys, we see that they affect some physics at high temperature. So is it clear that one can use, because as I understand, you use essentially the standard uh, estimate for the rate of baryon number violation. Could yeah. it be that these guys? Why, why, why would it be different? I mean, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it, you just rescale everything, right? What changes is if you want a number of degrees of, of thermalized degrees of freedom, but everything else is completely, no? Well, it's a multi-particle process. You, you do have multi-particle processes. Mm, yeah, but at the end of the day, what you're Something. computing is, uh, is a I mean, dimensionless quantity. Everything should be up to, uh, again, a rescaling of the number of relevant degrees of freedom. <coughs> We don't see any any difference. Maybe. I mean, in fact, yeah. Uh, the whole discussion about uh, what happens at large values of phi uh, metastable uh, uh, vacua, etc., uh, uh, of uh, of the Higgs field. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I guess, it's completely detached, or do you have some implications? Uh, so. Uh, oh, you mean, you mean the the. Yeah. What happens? The stability of the standard model. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, you see, here we have fields, uh, in our minds. That, so there has to be some UV cutoff that is way, way below that 10 to 14 or whatever, oh. 10 to 10 uh, GV where the where the quality becomes negative. Uh, because, uh, because we are adding uh, this singlet, and the singlet by itself has a, has a, um, has a beta function, uh, as a coupling that increases with the energy. So there is a null pole. So uh, indeed, this is why its couplings cannot be too large. Uh, so 100 TV is a good place to, to have a UV cutoff, but 10 to 10 is really, you cannot do that. I mean, wait. You can do it, but n has to be so large that it's. I mean, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe ten thousand. I don't know. You can do it. Questions? Comments? All right. So let's thank Luke again.